Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, an update on foreign affairs with former NATO Ambassador Kurt Volker. And we'll find out about an event designed to help improve the delivery of democracy. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. A four-day contempt of court hearing for Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio began today. Arpaio and his chief deputy are accused of failing to obey a U.S. district judge's orders in a racial profiling case against the sheriff's office. Now, today's testimony included a sergeant in the sheriff's department saying that Arpaio personally instructed him to effectively defy the judge's orders. Specifically, the sergeant said that Arpaio told him over the phone not to release a number of people detained at a traffic stop, even though the subjects were not suspected of violating a state crime. The sergeant testified that he held his ground and the subjects were eventually released, but only after the sergeant, on Arpaio's orders, took their photographs. U.S. warships are keeping a close eye on a convoy of Iranian cargo vessels off the coast of Yemen. There's concern that the ships may contain weapons intended for Houthi rebels in Yemen. Here to talk about that and other foreign affairs issues is former NATO Ambassador Kurt Volker, who currently heads ASU's McCain Institute. Good to have you back. Ted, great to be here. Boy, it's, it seems like every time we bring in everything, oh, you know what's breaking yeah. loose. Is it, does it feel like the world is readying for some sort of conflict? Well, I think that there are an enormous number of crises right now, and they keep spreading. I think part of that is they see a United States that has contracted some of its international role, and they see that there are opportunities, and the bad guys are the ones that step forward to fill the void. And yet we have U.S. warships again off the coast of Yemen here. We What's do. going on there? Uh, this is interesting because you've had the Saudi effort to go after the Houthi rebels in Yemen, which have been supplied by Iran. And this has been fueling a Sunni-Shia conflict in the Middle East. We've seen it play out in Syria, seen it play out in Iraq. We've begun to see it play out in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. What we're trying to do, the Saudis had an air operation to go after them. We're going to try to stop the flow of arms from Iran, try to isolate the rebels. And then that coincides with Saudi Arabia today announcing the end of the air campaign to try to promote now a political settlement. Th we'll see if it works. Why did they announce that end? Did, I know some of those bombs mm -hmm. were killing civilians. Yeah. There, that big well, factor. They were, they were losing, frankly. They weren't achieving their objectives. The objective was to restore the elected government and defeat the rebels and remove Iran's influence. They were not succeeding at that. The, the government is still deposed, and yet they were losing support from the civilian population because of the bombing. So they're trying a different tack, trying to isolate those rebels instead. So this is still mostly a proxy war between Iran Absolutely. and Saudi Arabia. Yeah, this is still going on, and it's going on here and many other places. Uh, the, the nine U.S. warships, I think uh, there's an aircraft carrier included. Mm -hmm. Is this mostly a deterrent? Is it a show of force? I mean, what happens if no, these other Iranian ships don't partial, stop? Partial blockade to try to prevent the arms from getting through. Um, I'm sure they will try to test it and see our resolve, whether we turn those ships around. Uh, there is a risk of some shots being fired, and obviously we don't want to see that, but that's what a blockade means, is that you've got to be willing to push those ships away. Did the, the, uh, the presence of those warships did that push Saudi Arabia to stop the bombing, maybe push Iran to hold off on getting these weapons Well, I in? suspect there's some discussions going on behind the scenes. Uh, I think probably we and others were advising the Saudis, what you're doing isn't going to work on its own. You've got to stop the flow of arms and you've got to have a political solution. So I think that we're contributing in an effort to help the Saudis out because what was going on was, was alienating the population. What about the presence of our warships and the impact maybe on the nuclear talks with Iran? Well, the nuclear talks, you know, have just gone downhill <laughs> completely. I mean, as soon as the deal was agreed, the Iranians come out and announce that, no, no, that was not the deal. We never agreed to that. Um, that means there's a lot of putting it together back to do uh, the Iranian rhetoric has gotten much worse over this, uh, blasting the United States and uh, saying that they're not going to be deterred. So I think maybe a U.S. show of force in the region is maybe something that's necessary to show that we're serious. But I don't think that this is going to derail either side from continuing the negotiations. We've got a few more months to go before the current interim agreement runs out. Indeed, but one, it, it just seems as though it's in Iran's best interest to just kicking the nuclear can down the road. It is. Well, they want to skate that line where they can maintain the capacity to produce enriched uranium 
to be able to have a breakout capacity later on, so you know, as quick as they can down the road, and not to have to give up too much. They also want to show strength in the eyes of their public. And one would have thought that the interim agreement as announced would have been sufficient for them, and they're saying, no, that's not even enough. We want to keep going beyond that. And they doubt that we would stop them. From where you sit and what you've seen in the past, and you know so much more about this than most, is this posturing? Do, do the Iranian leaders have to do a death to Satan kind of dance here to keep the populace thinking that they are tough guys and they're not giving? Meanwhile, behind the scenes, they're saying, all right, we can work with you. No, I, I think it's slightly different than that. I think that they do this, this anti-American dance, as you call it, in order to try to influence the population and influence the region, strengthen their own negotiating position. And ultimately, I think they doubt that we have the will to use military force to knock out their facilities. Uh, they doubt that Israel would be able to do it effectively either. And so they are playing with this agreement to dissuade us, to get the maximum possible, stretch out the timelines. But part of that is showing this, this resolve to just trash everything if they don't get what they want. And yet, we need them and they need us in the fight against the Islamic State. Well, we are cooperating together in Iraq. Uh, they are supporting the Iraqi government. We are also supporting the Iraqi government. We're supporting the Iraqi Kurds in this fight against ISIS. Uh, the ISIS is a Sunni element, like the Saudis are Sunnis, but that is the most extreme, uh, violent group that's out there. No one uh, really wants to support them, and so we have a common enemy there. And we have a problem in Iraq. It sounds like Anbar province is just going... That's serious. Yeah. That's serious. Ramadi has been taken over by ISIS now. Uh, Tikrit had been taken. It was taken back by the Iraqi authorities. ISIS also attacked the, the major oil refinery there. So ISIS is not on the ropes by any stretch. And the problem here is that the local population in the Sunni area is very distrustful of the government in Baghdad because of this relationship with Iran. So in, for some of them, they're going to look at ISIS as the lesser of two evils. Is, is ISIS the, yet another uh, result of uh, Saddam Hussein's old guard? Are, are these some of Well, some they're of trying Saddam? to recruit now. So ISIS is a result really of the collapse of Syria and Assad's attacks against his own people. And ISIS was the most virulent group to rise up in that rebellion against Assad, led by a guy who was a prisoner of US forces when we were in Iraq, uh, al-Baghdadi. Uh, they are now so strong that they are in a position to recruit people from uh, uh, the former regime in Iraq who are trained and competent former military leaders and commanders who can add to the capacity of ISIS. So where are they getting their money? Where are they getting their resources? Who's behind these folks? Uh, that's a great question. Some of it is self-generated, though. They are able to produce oil and gas and, and sell it on the black market and get dollars for it. They control significant pieces of territory. They've raided these uh, federal, you know, what we would call Federal Reserve offices, central bank offices in parts of Iraq that they've taken over. They've taken over the vaults and scooped out the money. Um, they're making millions of dollars a month. Is there any way for the U.S., the West, uh, other parties in the Middle East to control that flow of money? Uh, we've got to try, but I think the most important thing is to get the right coalition together to surround and squeeze ISIS. Right now, there's a lot of people who doubt our resolve in tackling ISIS because of our unwillingness to commit to their total defeat. We say degrade and eventually defeat. Uh, with Turkey, we have a difficult issue working together against ISIS because they want removing Assad and Syria to be part of that. With Iraq, we don't have a government in Iraq that the Sunni population trusts. With the Kurds, they're unhappy with how much support and how quickly we're giving it to them. They want more direct flows of arms to help them. They're the most competent uh, player in the region at the moment. So we don't have a together, strong coalition. We need that to really encircle ISIS and put the pressure on. It just seems as though, I, I just don't know who could be in favor. We had this video of, of ISIS uh, killing Ethiopian Christians oh, in Libya. Yeah. And now Libya is, is a supreme basket case. Because yes. We'll get to the, the immigrants coming into Italy in a second here, but is that video authentic? And is, what does Ethiopia, does Ethiopia respond like <laughs> Egypt did with, with bombing campaigns? Well, first off, let's, there's no reason to think it's not authentic. ISIS has done this sort of thing all over the place. So yes, and, and you even see it as copycat killings where it may not be ISIS, the same people in Iraq, but people in Somalia or Ethiopia who are trying to mimic and show that they are faithful to that uh, same uh, violent religious ideology. 
Uh, in terms of what you do about that, you've got to strengthen states and strengthen governance, and we've got to do this cooperatively as a community that doesn't support and doesn't favor these things. Right now, we have such weak states, whether, as you pointed out, Libya or Somalia or Mali, um, that we are seeing the inability to control territory and the ability of these radical groups to gain control of assets and then export their violence from there. It almost feels like these radical groups are modern-day pirates. Uh, they are, but of a very, very extreme version. Yeah. So, I mean, but the the, uh, the attempts to uh, control pirates in the past. I mean, I don't know how they're not a state. I mean, they they they're well, just so did, free floating. <laughs> what we did when we had pirates in you know, the early days of our republic was go in there and kill them. Yeah. <laughs> and that that was really what we did. So we we are tired of wars in the Middle East. We don't want to talk about boots on the ground. But the fact is. The you know piracy on the high seas was just punishable by death. Period. So uh, back to the Ethiopia, could could Ethiopia align with Egypt to respond? And uh, but who do you respond against? Well, it's these different groups, and and they are uh, getting funding. They are aligned ideologically with each other. Sometimes they're sharing tactics. Sometimes personnel. And just to move on to Libya quickly, what we saw in Libya, we removed Gaddafi from power a couple of years ago with a NATO air campaign, but we never helped the government that emerged gain control of the country. There's no stabilization operation, no follow-on, no collection of weapons. As a result of that, all of these various groups stayed in place and now have grown, and there's just total chaos in that country now. Indeed, and there's such chaos that you got a lot of folks trying to leave from Libya exactly. because it's the closest way to get to, to southern Europe. Uh, they're going into Italy, and boats are capsizing people. We're hearing Muslims throwing Christians overboard in the Mediterranean. I mean, it just sounds crazy. Yes. Well, imagine, first off, if you're a poor worker, in any of these places where governments are breaking down, the economy's not functioning, you have very little hope, and you feel physically threatened, what do you want to do? You want to get on a boat and go to Europe. You go to places that are ungoverned, like parts of Libya, where all you do is pay a bribe to a smuggler to get you across. Once you get to the European Union, EU, the EU has a policy that they will treat you uh, for, as a prospect for asylum. They're going to feed you, they're going to clothe you, and it's going to take some time even if you don't make it in the end, but you think you probably will as an asylee, uh, you're going to be better taken care of there than you were uh, where you were coming from. So people are flocking to these boats, paying money to get on them, and this is uh, not handled well by the EU, I have to say. They don't have the resources in place to stop these earlier. They get on the high seas in the Mediterranean. Some of them capsize. We've seen 3, 000, or three times more people die in 2015 in this space of time this year than we saw last year, three times as many. And some of the estimates that we're on a track to see 30,000 people die on the Mediterranean this year. So what does the EU do? Uh, I think you have to look at the policy of uh, repatriation. It's, it's a brutal policy. You say, okay, we're, we're going to take these people back to where they came from. But if you don't do that, people are just going to continue to see the incentive to get on these boats. So that's one policy they're going to have to look at, is the, the returning of these refugees to countries where they came from. Uh, the second is that the EU has got to have an EU-wide approach. Right now, the brunt of this falls onto Italy because it is the closest point of land to where they're coming from. The Italians aren't capable of dealing with this themselves. They need a lot more EU support. So uh, will we say, and as far as the rest of the EU, uh, does this, I know that immigration and, and migrants in, in Europe, it's becoming a major topic. How is that affecting politics well, over exactly. There? It's fueling anti-immigrant sentiment, uh, anti-Muslim sentiment, sometimes anti-Semitic sentiment, just because you get these, this tribalism that rises up. And it's happening in France. You see the, uh, the party of Marine Le Pen, the far-right party, among the most popular in France right now. Scary thought if they would win an election. You see anti-immigrant sentiment fueling the UKIP, the UK Independence Party in the United Kingdom. You see the Allianz for Deutschland in Germany. And you see this throughout Central Europe as well. You see the rise of far-right parties. So it is shifting politics in Europe. And it's, it, ISIS alone seems to be shifting politics, or at least political thought, all over the world. Because you have a group like that, people want security. They start right. leaning toward the right, maybe farther than they otherwise that's right. would. Right. No, that's exactly right. You go to your national identity. You go to security. You go to your your ethnic tribalism. And you want law and order. You want police. You want a military. Do we have to? Does that, does that mean the Assads, the Husseins, the Gaddafis of the world are? Um, we used to think of them as necessary evils. Was that altogether wrong? Well, uh, 
I hate to think of it that way because there's no reason we should be forced into extremes. We either support a dictator who brutalizes his people or we you know, are trying to not support a dictator and end up with these terrorists. There is a wide swath of people in every country, including the Middle East, of people who just want to have normal lives. But they feel boxed out by these two extremes. Right. I think where we as the United States or a Western community should be, should be helping provide some security, work with the governments that are there, but then also work with them ease up on the human rights, protect the rights of your population, find ways to be inclusive. It's a long way to go. I think we've actually gone backwards since 2011 and the days of the Arab Spring. But if you just have brutal dictatorships, all it's going to do is push these groups underground and fuel more extremism down the road. Well, the Arab Spring just seems like millions and millions of years it ago. It does. Tunisia is a success story. You know, if you look at Tunisia, they've had successful elections. They've got a, mo a moderate Islamic party. They've got politicians who are trying to keep the country together. That should be the model that we'd like to see elsewhere. All right. Always great to speak with you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Each year, ASU's Center for the Study of Race and Democracy presents a lecture designed to promote new ideas on participatory democracy. This year's keynote speaker will be Anderson Cooper of CNN. Here with more on the event is Matthew Whitaker, the founding director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Good to see you again, as Good always. Good to see you, Ted. Uh, yeah. Delivering democracy lecture. What are we talking about here? We're talking about actually something that's more of an event. So it begins with a resource fair that begins earlier in the day at 2 o'clock. And we're going to have some 40 um, uh, nonprofits, companies, um, organizations represented in the Valley that are there that's going to provide information to everybody uh, about everything from midwifery to saving money on your energy bill to voter advocacy to all sorts of things. And then we're going to move them into the sanctuary where they'll be treated to a gospel concert by one of the best choirs in the United States, some say uh, South of Heaven. And then Anderson Cooper is going to come on to be the highlight uh, of, of the evening. He's going to deliver um, an address about the ways in which the media in particular can play uh, a critical role or has played a cr critical role and can play even a better role in helping people understand the ways in which democracies and em emerging democracies work, their struggles and some of the things that um, are, 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 are best practices in terms of how to uh, maximize democratic uh, principles and access. You know, in delivering democracy, that's the lecture. Uh, your group has democracy in the name, this, this, this platform for ideas on participatory democracy. The right. key word here is democracy. Define right. democracy. There are so many different definitions for democracy, but we at the center de define democracy as um, access, um, uh, a, a, a society that is defined by and uh, executed by and shaped by the people, um, having equal access and equal say, and uh, particularly through the voting process, in shaping our destiny as a people. Um, but we also investigate the way in ways in which democracy has been defined over the years as it has evolved in different societies. So we don't um, claim that there is one definition of democracy. Some people have, have, have invoked the small d democracy, mm -hmm. the big d, d democracy. Democracy is a principle. D democracy is something that's tangible. And we like to explore what all of those different meanings are, but what people generally are asking and, and shooting for now in our society. So we, we look at it as something that's evolving. What about the concept of democracy as simply something that has been misunderstood or distorted? We investigate that as well. What I often tell folks and they say, well, um, you direct the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Are we actually a democracy? 
And sometimes I'll say technically we are a representative a republic. Mm -hmm. um, we're not a true democracy. Going back to the, your, your initial question, a lot of people when they hear democracy, they think one man, one woman, one vote. Um, we are really a republic, which means we elect people based upon certain criteria to um, make decisions for us. And so some folks say that's not the best system for us, but we like to interrogate what that means. But, and, but and again, the idea of, of ideas on participatory democracy, in order to participate, you got to know what to watch out for. You got to watch out for those distortions. You do. You have to watch out for them. So one of the things that we do is we monitor all sorts of things, voting habits, voting irregularities, uh, what people know about voting. Uh, as a professor, I'm always stunned and disheartened, uh, particularly with the younger population, because I'll go into class, I just went in this past year in the fall, and I said, on, it, this was a Monday, how many of you know that there's an election tomorrow? And a handful of hands went up. And this is in a U.S. history class. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons why I came up with the idea of a Delivering Democracy lecture is because I believe that we have to deliver um, our understanding and notions about what democracy is, why it's important, and what role we play in shaping it. But are these going to be new ideas, or are these these ideas that have been simply forgotten or left by the wayside? Both. You know, last year we brought in Forrest Whitaker, and he was very much um, interested in talking to everybody. It was very inspirational lectures, very thoughtful, very cerebral. It was almost professorial. Mm -hmm. And he basically said, we need to think about um, the ways in which we can incorporate the arts and use the arts to understand how people can communicate the ways in which they want their society to function. And this isn't something that's new, but he certainly put a very unique spin on it using his own life to inspire people to say, we all have a responsibility, but this is how you can use your unique talents. For him, it was the arts. And for Anderson Cooper, it'll be the media. It's going and to be the media. What are you expecting to hear from Anderson Cooper? Well, you know, we, we actually sent him a, a little bit of a missive saying this is sort of what we would look 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 for and, and, and want from you. And he has been on the front line of so many different issues, particularly from TREP, when we talk about law enforcement mm -hmm. and communities and all of the conflicts we've been dealing with, he's been on the front line from Trevon Martin to Oscar Grant to Walter Scott. And we, we're very interested in his take on the ways in which the media have reported on this case, uh, researched these cases, and the influence they might have in shape, shaping people's public opinion about where we are in society. And that's going to be kind of a, one of those deals where the, the, the goalposts will be moving because the media, the delivery of news and information is changing rapidly. Changes all the time. And in fact, when we designed this lecture, um, with my ideas and the others I ran them by, we actually had a media person in mind for this particular lecture. Um, we're so close to the Cronkite School. Mm -hmm. Most of the students that I teach down, downtown are connected to the Cronkite School. We thought it was a natural collaboration. But things are changing so quickly. And Cooper is one of those folks that has been on the front line of that constant change. And so we're hoping that he can help us understand how to manage it. I was going to say, what do you hope people take now from the lecture, from the day, from the, the event, the exhibits, from the conversation, from the lecture? I want them to take away with what folks took away last year. And that number, that's number one. We want them to be inspired and we want their interest and love for democracy and, and, and the wonderful thing that we have in America. We want them to be inspired to get back in, dig in, and be engaged civically because it's going to take that engagement for us to nurture our democracy and take it to the next level. We want that. We want them to also experience the diversity in the room. We had elected leaders, we had law enforcement, community folk, black, white, Latino, Asian American, Jewish, Catholic. We had, we had them all in one room. Um, little old ladies that live down the street from this building with the mayor of Phoenix. And so we wanted them in the same room to have a conversation. It's almost like this huge public forum about where we are, where we need to go. Okay, but you got, you got a, a bunch of folks that are by their nature interested. They wouldn't be there if they weren't somewhat interested. Right. How do you get that interest to expand? How do we, we, that's why we began with the resource fair. Because what I'm going to say at the end is we brought you together, we've inspired you, We've given, we're going to be, they're going to be inspired, let me tell you. We've given you um, some food for thought. We've given you some perspective and maybe even some marching orders. But now we've also introduced you to more than 40 organizations that you can match up some of your talent, some of your skills, some of your interest in to get in and be involved. And that's going to be, to be the responsibility and the charge I leave them with. Okay, when, where? Give us the information on the Saturday, event. April 25th, Resource Fair begins at 2 o'clock. 
Um, the, the gospel concert will begin at 4 and Anderson Cooper will take the stage promptly at 4 at 430 at Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church in downtown Phoenix, right on Jefferson Street. Right there on Jefferson, 13th, 14th, 13th, somewhere along there? It's 13th and 13th. Jefferson, okay. that's right. And uh, for more information, where to? The, you can log on to CSRD. Um, dot ASU dot edu. We have an entire Anderson Cooper Delivering Democracy event page. All right, Matthew, always a pleasure. Good to see you. Thank you very much, Ted. On Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, we'll update the contempt of court hearing against Sheriff Joe Arpaio, and we'll hear about TEDx Phoenix, a local gathering of inspirational speakers. That's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.